importance to life. It filters our blood, produces chemicals that aid digestion, and stores nutrients we need every day. But what happens when its functions are compromised? We examine ailments of the liver. The doctors are on call tonight. Funding for On Call is provided in part by... Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding provided by Dakota Care, Regional Health, the Brookings Health System, Dr. Mark Bubach with Dakota Allergy and Asthma, the South Dakota American College of Physicians, and Swiftel Communications. Closed captioning for On Call is provided by the generous support of Avera, the Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation. Good evening. This week's medical topic is all about the liver, which is the large solid organ tucked up underneath the diaphragm and rib cage on the right side of your abdomen. The liver has many jobs to, including, to include filtering all the nutritional rich venous blood coming off the small intestines, making food into bodybuilding products, clotting factors, and energy movers while removing poisons. Besides returning processed blood toward the heart, the liver also breaks down old red cells and makes a detergent-like material called bile, which is dumped back into the small intestine where it goes to work dissolving fat and aiding digestion. The liver can sometimes become sick from inherited disorders, many kinds of viral infections, or overpowering poisons, drugs, or alcohol. When the liver is sick, People lose their appetites, become malnourished, turn yellow, and bleed. Here to help us better understand the value of the liver and the conditions that can affect it is Dr. Hesham al Ghori, a hepatologist and liver transplant expert from Avera Medical Group Liver Disease in Sioux Falls. Starting with training in infectious disease at Albuquerque, New Mexico, he followed this with training in liver at the Cleveland Clinic in Ohio. He becomes he comes prepared to answer all our questions about the liver. Welcome, Hashem Alguri. Appreciate Thank you. you being here. Thank you. Well, where's your original home? Egypt. So you're an Egyptian infectious disease specialist and liver specialist. Now, why is that pertinent about Egypt? Um, well, Egypt is um, one of the country that uh, has the highest prevalence of hepatitis C. Um, some estimates about 15-20% of all populations have hepatitis C. So uh, liver disease, cirrhosis of the liver and chronic liver problems may be number one cause of death in Egypt. In Egypt? It's not like heart as here. Right. Um, so everybody goes to the medical school in Egypt has some interest in liver disease, believe it or not. Because they're related to Because something. it's related, and I'm sure everybody has some one of his family with liver disease, and so the interest is always there in all uh, medical students. And after I finished my medical school, uh, I came here after my internship. Um, I did my residency first in Texas Tech University in uh, Odessa, Texas. Uh, chief residency there, and then infectious disease fellowship then hepatology and transplant hepatology at Cleveland Clinic. Now a lot of the hepatologists don't have that infectious disease background that you have. Yeah. So that's really extra special. I mean, have you found that that uh, gives you a step up uh, as you talk about liver disease? Yes, for sure. Uh, as you said, that uh, infectious causes of liver disease is very broad. And um, the infectious disease background and training, I think, give me a very um, special training how to deal with, with infectious diseases uh, of liver. And uh, hep C now, which is the most 
most uh, common infectious disease of the liver. Hep C or hepatitis C, yeah. the most common infectious disease of the liver. Yeah. The, the way that we are managing hepatitis C now is the same way HIV has been treated or managed uh, several years ago. So um, we are going the same track as infectious disease experts did about 10, 15 years ago for HIV. And, and we'll have to talk about that more, but, <clears throat> but I would like to um, go into, you also are involved with uh, liver transplants. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. Well, hopefully nobody needs liver transplant, but unfortunately this is what a lot of people in the United States need. Uh, liver transplantation is basically you are removing the old sick organ and both in your liver in the same place. And this is what we name it orthotopic. Orthotopic means you put the new liver in the same exact location as the old liver was. And the most common reason for people to have liver transplant is liver failure. People who have cirrhosis of the liver from whatever reasons, alcohol, hepatitis C, hepatitis B, who came to the point that the liver fails. They have jaundice, they have fluid accumulation in the abdomen called ascites, they have confusion. So or fluid is, uh, accumulation in the abdomen called ascites, so that's just the belly filling up with fluid. Yeah. Yep. So all these are the signs of liver failure and those people either they will die eventually or they need liver transplant. The problem is a lot of people on the transplant even die because there is no available organ for everybody. So this is why it's very important for every one of us to think about uh, you know, donating the liver after death or even during life, the living donor liver transplantation is a growing practice, especially in big centers where a lot of people are listed and the number of diseased organs are much less. So there are half of the people who are in need of a liver die before they get it? I'll say much less than half. Uh, every year is about five to 6,000 people get liver transplantation in the United States. Um, but about 10% of people die every year on the transplant list, which is a very big um, number because those people, they, they either, as I said, they need liver transplant or they will die. Um, but, and there are many people who have liver disease that could be or should be on the transplant list but are not on the list because they've got other illnesses. Oh, yes. So I, I, that number is much larger. Not everybody uh, who needs liver transplant is qualified to get liver transplant. What do you have to do to qualify for a liver transplant? Uh, relatively healthy, which is not the case uh, all the time meaning you should have strong heart, strong lungs, uh, no alcohol on the board. The people have to be off alcohol for at least six months plus going through a rehab program for alcohol. Um, there is no cancer. Even if they have liver cancer, they can get liver transplant, but within limits. If the cancer in the liver or hepatocellular carcinoma, which is a primary liver cancer, Let's say that, what kind of carcinoma? Hepatocellular carcinoma. Hepatocellular carcinoma, yeah. which means that it is of the cells of the liver, not of the, of the, of the bile tract of yes. the liver. Yes, the cholangiocarcinoma is the name of the cancer of the bile duct. But hepatocellular carcinoma originally comes from the liver cells called hepatocytes. And certain people with that liver cancer could be qualified for liver transplantation if we catch them early. And this is the, uh, very important for all of the healthcare providers and even the patients. If someone has cirrhosis of the liver, he or she has to be evaluated and screened every six months for uh, liver cancer. Because cirrhosis sets you up for liver cancer. Yep. But hepatitis C sets you up for liver cancer. Uh, if the, most of the people with hepatitis C or any cancer have cirrhosis of the liver. So it's a cirrhosis. Yes. Now, let's talk about cirrhosis of the liver. I mean, there are a lot of reasons why people get cirrhosis. I mean, the most common is alcohol excess, right? Uh, the way I always was told, now correct me if I'm wrong, uh, I learned m many years ago that you have, a, uh, for some reason or another, that particular excessive alcohol uh, about brought on an inflammatory response in the liver. The liver gets hepatitis, inflammation of the liver. Mm -hmm. The hepatitis resolves and the liver shrinks back to its original wellness except that it's been beat up a bit. So there's scars that occur. 
then another episode, and then it shrinks back after it heals, but it gets scars again, and what cirrhosis is is basically the liver being replaced by scar. Mm -hmm. Is that a simplified, how would you put True, it? True, but that resolved inflammation happens if the person stops drinking. If the patient continues to drink, I don't think the inflammation will go away. It will keep going and well, going the, and the inflammation going, and the inflammation will keep going, and the scars will get worse and worse and worse, and then the patient has cirrhosis. Right. I have seen people who are less than 25 years old who have cirrhosis of the liver from alcohol because they started early and they continue to drink alcohol. Despite the fact that we could see the writing in the wall, the liver yep. was getting... So <clears throat> uh, what about other causes of cirrhosis though? Hepatitis C causes inflammation of the liver and then it scars down mm -hmm. and cirrhosis occurs there. That's true. So hepatitis C is very common. Um, about four million Americans have hepatitis C. The scary thing about hepatitis C is that about 50 to 75 percent of people with hepatitis C are not aware that, that they've they got it. Hepatitis C. That's very scary. 50 percent or more or even of more. the people who have hepatitis C don't know they've got it. And of course, <clears throat> what we should do is we should talk about what is hepatitis. Yeah. Uh, but before we do that, let's talk about what the liver does. I mean, tell me more about the liver. Well, the liver is a very prestigious organ. Prestigious. Uh, yeah. An important <laughs> organ. I hear that from a hepatologist. Yeah, well, maybe I'm biased. But oh, yeah, well, the neurologists say the brain's the most important organ, but then, you know, True. the cardiologist the heart and, uh, and on and on. I think what is what's really very unique about the liver is it is a very active organ until now we don't have a replacement therapy for it except transplant. Uh, kidney failure can be replaced by dialysis, the heart, those cardiology guys are very smart now they do all this kind of machines and pumping and pacing and pacemakers and all those things. But the liver, if it fails, it fails. There is nothing can be done except transplant. And liver cirrhosis or liver failure is a multi-organ involvement. It's not only liver cirrhosis, just liver is sick, and that's all. No, the heart will be sick, the kidney will be sick, the lungs will be sick, the brain will be sick, the muscles will be weak. So every single organ in the uh, body will be sick and it, cirrhosis. Is that mostly because the liver is so important in bringing nutrition? True. Or is it because the liver is so important in screening out poisons and detoxifying? Both. You know how many, how many function you think the liver does Well, those two every, big ones. Yeah, how many, how many function you think the liver does every minute? Well, okay. 5,000. 5,000 functions. Every okay. single minute. Okay, explain that between uh, taking care of all toxins coming to the liver from the gut, from forming all form of nutrient elements, amino acid, glucose, and fatty acids, getting rid of the uh, excessive amount of energy or storing it. Uh, so if you've got this amount of energy, it'll either store it or it'll bring it out. And exactly. So it, it neutralizes the amount of energy that we have That's going exactly on. right. Form the bile, which is very important in our digestion, especially for the fat. So it has a lot of, of function, uh, immune system related function because... Well, because it's one of the lymph nodes, they say, the exactly. largest lymph node. The, the spleen and node. the liver are lymph node function, yeah. right? Exactly. The liver is, by the way, is the second largest organ in the body. What's the first? Skin. The skin's the first organ. Yes. So the first no, is skin, <laughs> the liver is the second, the brain is the third, the lung is number four, the heart is number five. So we are number two. Okay, and so the skin is the <laughs> biggest organ. That's, that's right. interesting, and even though the skin is just skin thick. Yes, that's right. It's a lot of it, mm -hmm. and it does a, an important function as well. Yeah. Well, then you've got this fabulous organ that sits up underneath the diaphragm, and it does all these great things. And it amazes me that it, it is not sicker than it, uh, than it is because it is really the filter that takes the toxins out of all of the food that we eat and people stuff a lot of different poisons down their throat, don't they? That's right. And one of the things about the liver is is a very polite 
organ. Or a polite organ. Yeah, it doesn't complain that much. <laughs> right. Even I if someone is hitting the liver from alcohol or some other liver problems, it doesn't complain. It's not like the heart, you know, gets chest pain. It's not like the lungs, you get cough or shortness of breath. It's organ that keep going with the function. Tell it say, oh my God, I'm done. This guy is hitting me very badly and I I'm, have to I'm, quit. I'm quitting. So this is why it's very important for people to know that to diagnose someone with liver disease or to pick up someone with liver disease or to discover liver disease in someone is not based on symptoms only. Because it's symptoms are very few, really. Very few, cool. very nonspecific, and if it comes, sometimes it comes late. Let's say jaundice or fluid in the abdomen or that ascites, usually there are signs or symptoms of late liver disease. Right. So, so it, it doesn't, it's a non-complaining, it doesn't even hurt much. It, no. There's not a lot of pain. It doesn't, pain. except if the, you know, this, I mean, the liver is very large, stretching the capsule, then it can cause pain. And this is why the screen for, I think, the key point uh, that, you know, very important in our discussion today is the screening for risk factors for liver disease. So I, I have to say, I have to respond to the, the point of, oh, well, we have liver tests that we can draw, blood tests that yeah. look at the liver. But my, <coughs> my experience through the years that I've been doing this is that they don't always show you True. when there's a liver that's, problem. That's a very, on. very important point. See, the, the, again, the screening for risk factors, people should know risk factor for liver disease. Okay, so let's, let's talk about the risk factors. So the risk factors for liver disease, uh, I would say something scary. Diabetes is a very strong risk factor for liver disease. We all know from our medical school and our training, and even the patients themselves, if you have diabetes, think about the heart from heart attack. Right. Think about the uh, uh, eyes for cataract and retinopathy and all this kind. Think about the uh, kidneys for from kidney failure, from diabetes. Kimmel Steel Wilson. Uh, uh, think about nerves from neuropathy, but nobody think about the liver. They don't think about the yeah. liver. It's this innocent little. <laughs> that's not fair, you know. That? Unfair, <laughs> humble <laughs> organ, True. quietly stuck up there and the stuck up there and the. Yeah. So, so the diabetes, the high blood pressure, overweight, um, high cholesterol, all are risk factors for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So, if someone has any of that, we should think about liver disease. So let's let's non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Yeah. I've often thought that the most common cause, and we need to turn shortly, but the most common reason for fatty liver disease is fatty. Mm -hmm. Person is overweight. Yep. But uh, a diabetic who's not overweight is still at risk? Yes. Person who is hypertension, type hypertensive but not overweight is at risk for yes. fatty liver disease? Yes. So, so what? I mean, so you've got fat in your liver. Yeah. I mean, you know, what, what's the consequence of that? And, and uh, very shortly. Uh, it can lead to cirrhosis and liver failure, liver cancer. It, if people have what we call NASH, NASH, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, which means fat causing inflammation yep. of the liver, can lead to cirrhosis and liver cancer. And liver cirrhosis, failure. and then with cirrhosis failure, and also with cancer, because yep. the cancer follows the cirrhosis. Exactly. Great. If a liver begins to lose function, it may become necessary to explore the transplant options. Often when we think of transplants, we think of a donor who has died in an accident. But there are, there is sometimes the option of a live donor. Mark Eklund has a love for sports and spending time with his family. He's a very active guy. That's why it was surprising when in 1994 he started to experience rapid weight loss and wasn't feeling like himself. So he went in to see his doctor. Well, he did a, a complete physical, but really the blood test came back with elevated uh, liver enzymes. And then, of course, in the physical exam, he noticed my enlarged liver and spleen. Mark was sent to a specialist and underwent further testing before he was diagnosed with primary biliary cirrhosis, a liver disease. Basically, it's a very slow moving disease. Uh, he kind of gave us a, a range of uh, potentially five to ten years before 
we might be in a position to, to need a transplant. He was referred on to the Mayo Clinic and was put on experimental medication, which did slow the progression of the disease. But over the years, it was becoming apparent that Mark would need another option, a live liver transplant. We were hopeful that that might be a possibility instead of having to be so sick and near death before you'd be high enough on a transplant list to receive a, a cadaver, a, a deceased donor liver. Several friends and family members stepped forward to be tested, including his brother and son. But it was Mark's wife's first cousin, a non-blood relative, who made it through the careful screening process. She says she never doubted her decision. Well, I would tell my husband, I go, the thought of he has two kids and that he wouldn't be around to walk his daughter up getting married and see his kids graduate, I'm going. I said, he needs to be a part of that. He needs to be with my cousin and for the golden years and all that, and he's family. We just couldn't believe that she would um, take that upon herself to, to give me that opportunity to, to have a transplant earlier than, than I probably would have had. Mark and Karen underwent a five-hour surgery, during which he was given 60% of her liver. They were the 30th live liver transplant at the Mayo Clinic, and the surgery was a success. Today, I, I feel like I can almost do anything. I have my energy level back. I really have my life back. Family support was very important during both of their recoveries, and Mark and Karen recommend organ donation because it can truly save a life. And I've told them before, if I had to do it all over again, I'd do it in a heartbeat. Well, you know, she's my angel. She saved my life. That's about all I can say. Thanks. <laughs> you can't say thank you enough. Thank you, Coach Eklund, for that wonderful story. So he, he had a live donor mm -hmm. of, a kid, of a kidney, of a liver transplant. He had uh, the gift of a cousin of his wife who was willing to uh, give half of her liver. Now, of the donors, of the transplants that you're doing right now, what percentage would you say are from live donors? Well, it depends on the center of the transplant. Uh, in some centers, it's less than 5%, in others, maybe less than 10%. But the point is, it's getting uh, more frequent done, or more frequently done, because, as I said, there is some great shortage of uh, diseased organ or diseased uh, donor because the number of people who really need liver transplant is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And the people, and, and so the, the question really arises, what can we do to encourage people to be a donor? And, uh, you know, uh, as far as uh, uh, donating your organs after your death, uh, I think the most important message I would have for any of you out there is to say, I don't care what your age is or whatever the story is, say to your family out loud sometime, and today would be good to tell them, if I have brain death but my organs are living, give them to someone who's still alive. And in that way, I will still be alive, uh, and that way I will be uh, giving truly to another human. That's exactly right. I mean. What is better than giving a, a, uh, a gift of life? You are, gift, you are giving someone a gift that will give him or her a life. There's nothing we, better than that. Nothing better than that. Yeah. So, um, but let's tell yeah. me the stories. Uh, give me a couple of stories of transplants that have occurred or recently or... In we uh, at um, McKinnon Hostel, we have a lot of people coming to us for liver failure, liver cancer, need liver transplantation, and we're very successful in setting um, a, um, a model of liver transplantation where people who need liver uh, can get every single uh, step of care they need in Sioux Falls, and um, the transplant uh, is done in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and then they come back to Sioux Falls or the surrounding area, and everything needed after the transplant is also done at uh, Sioux Falls. So it's more convenient to the people. We have a lot of people, uh, actually a uh, recent lady from Brookings got liver transplantation uh, through that system, and she's <coughs> doing wonderful. Now, now that was, that was a <coughs> cadaver transplant. Yeah. 
<coughs> excuse me, um, the case that we talked about was of a living donor. And it, it uh, tell us about how that works. I mean, I mean, you have one liver, right? Mm -hmm. You can actually give part of your liver, they cut it in half, explain that. So the liver is a very active organ, as I said, and the, the capacity of the liver to regenerate is very high. To if regenerate, rebuild itself. Rebuild, exactly. So if you cut half of the liver within a few months, it should go back to the normal size. And, and this is why it's, if you cut part of the liver, give it to someone who really need it, then the donor should have no problem because the liver will regenerate and take care of the, you know, that person. Now people talk about two lobes of the liver. Mm -hmm. uh, explain that. So the two lobe is kind of uh, old anatomy. Um, we have the liver is divided into eight segments. And sometimes people get, it depends on the, the, the patient size, there's something called uh, the ratio between the, the organ or the part of the liver that this person need and the size of that uh, patient. So sometimes, for example, the kid, you can give that kid two segments of the liver and that would be enough, uh, maybe more if adult with high body mass index. So it depends. But if you cut, let's say, four segments of the liver, or sometimes the right lobe of the liver or the left lobe of the liver, that person still could, the donor could be just fine. Just fine. Yeah. Um, and I, I know that in, um, in kidney transplants, sometimes they'll take infant or even pre-birth children who, who have passed away but whose kidneys are still viable and they've transplanted these tiny little kidneys or I'm, I'm thinking I'm right on this. And in a matter of months, the kidney turns into an adult kidney. Do they do that with with um, with livers? I haven't heard about that. No. Okay, I hadn't heard about that yeah. either. I, I I do know about small kidneys mm -hmm. that can really take over uh, function over a period of time. Um, well, uh, you know, and the people who give the don the don donate their liver, they have postoperative pain. They have they have postoperative complication risks. Mm -hmm. But most of them do very, very well. Yes, that's right. Uh, what a huge gift uh, that was for Coach Eklund. Let, let's talk about the causes of, of hepatitis and the causes of cirrhosis now. We've talked about uh, hepatitis C. Maybe we should start with hepatitis C uh, more because um, it's probably the most common infection. Mm -hmm. Hepatitis B and A. Those are other kinds. Let's separate it from those. Yeah, Hep C again is number one cause of infectious causes of cirrhosis. And uh, about 4 million Americans have hepatitis C. And as I said, 50 to 75 percent are not aware of that they have the infection. And this will bring me back to that key word, screen for people who have risk factors. Uh, and what are the risk factors again for hepatitis C? Uh, IV drug use, intravenous drug use. Okay, so IV drug use. Even once. Some right. people said, well, I use it only one time. Well, one is enough to get the virus. So right. one time even, we should screen for hepatitis C. Uh, blood transfusion before 1992, July of 1992, because back then there was no screening for the blood. So if you had a transfusion, you've been fine all your life, but the transfusion was before 1992, we weren't screening for hepatitis C, you should be tested. Yes, okay, even, even the liver enzymes are normal. And this is again, the liver test, as you said, could be normal. 13% of people who have a lot of scars in the liver from hepatitis C, they have normal liver test. All right, and you know, we're gonna have to ask this question, uh, that is, let's say I have hepatitis C, can I do anything about it? But, but before we, we wanna finish the risk factors, what else? So uh, the third is if you have someone uh, with like partner with hepatitis C, so sexual transmission of hepatitis C could happen. It is very rare, but it could happen. So sexual transmission, is that's, it's more hepatitis B that's sexual True, but C could happen, is much rarer than hepatitis B. And this is why if a spouse has hepatitis C, 
the other should be tested for hepatitis okay. C. All right, but it doesn't mean that it'll be passed. True. Uh, mothers with hepatitis C could pass it to the kid, especially if they have HIV. Okay. Uh, multiple sexual partners or high-risk sexual behavior could lead to hepatitis C infection All right. as well. All right. We have a video of a cartoon or a, um, a, an illustration of hepatitis C. I think it would be a good time to run that right now. The liver is a large reddish-brown glandular organ located in the upper right portion of the abdominal cavity. It secretes bile and performs several important functions. The hepatitis C virus is a blood-borne pathogen and primarily affects the liver. The hepatitis C virus contains RNA, or ribonucleic acid, as the genetic material in its core, which is surrounded by a fatty envelope. The virus enters the body, circulates in the bloodstream, and attaches to liver cells. Once attached, the virus releases the RNA into the healthy cells. The viral RNA then replicates itself hundreds or thousands of times, making genetic material required to produce new viruses. These new viruses in turn infect other liver cells. Eventually, this process shuts down most of the normal functions of the liver cell and damages it. Symptoms of hepatitis, jaundice, mild fever, muscle and joint aches, nausea, vomiting, loss of appetite, abdominal pain. This infection may continue for years, eventually resulting in scarring of the liver tissue, called cirrhosis. Liver cancer can also develop in later stages. So I thought that illustrated it, uh, pretty well uh, what hepatitis C, uh, in, a, in a graphic way, what hepatitis C is all about. It's a viral infection that spreads. Mm -hmm. uh, anything more about hepatitis C we should make sure people understand? Um, it is a silent disease. People will not have specific symptoms. You could have fatigue, you could have joint pain, some discomfort in the abdomen. That's, that's it. it. All their life until the cirrhosis comes to a point and then liver can start, liver cancer can start in that exactly. cirrhosis. Exactly. We have a very scary, um, uh, very sad story as well. A lady came to us, she was 82 years old and she presented with liver failure, with jaundice and ascites, the fluid in the abdomen, and liver cancer, both. And only by then, when she presented with that very, very late stage of liver disease, we diagnosed her with hepatitis C. So it's something that sits there quietly True. all these years, sets you up for hepatitis C, or for, for cirrhosis, and subsequently cancer. Exactly, and her risk factor was she had transf blood transfusion back in 1980, and this is why it's very important to screen for risk factors for hepatitis C, for hepatitis B, for fatty liver disease, for alcohol, and that will need the help from the patient themselves. Yeah. Don't hide. Don't uh, be saying, no, uh, I'm, I'm not drinking that much, or no, I did not use drugs. If you have risk factor for liver disease, say it, because if we catch liver disease early, who can make a lot of difference. Now let's talk about uh, hepatitis C. What difference can we make? I mean, what can I do if I found out, okay, I've got hepatitis C, I got it from a blood transfusion, mm -hmm. or whatever it might be. Now I'm, you know, I'm gonna be older, I'm afraid that it might, t what can I do to stop it? Very good. So there is something very important uh, to do, is to make sure you are not going to transmit some other people around you. So you have to have your own personal uh, uh, things, you know, your razors, your uh, toothbrushing, and all these things should not be used with some other people. The partner should be screened for hepatitis C. We should avoid alcohol. If someone has hepatitis C, we should avoid alcohol because that will accelerate the risk of liver cirrhosis from alcohol, from hepatitis C. Weight. People with uh, uh, overweight problems, that will also accelerate the damage uh, from hepatitis C. Diabetes, if someone has diabetes, that should be under very tight control if they have hepatitis C. Uh, all these things should be done. If someone is not immunized to hepatitis A or hepatitis B, they should get they that should immunization. Be exactly. Because if you get hepatitis B or A on top of it, it's, it's, it's very tough dangerous. Tough. And then to think about treatment. Uh, and this is very, very important point because 
Sometimes we feel from some patients coming to us uh, the under impression that there is no treatment for hepatitis C. But there is. is. There is. And even if some other people say there is treatment for hepatitis C, but it doesn't work and it causes other problem, hair loss and depression and this and that, and that's partially true. But the benefit of treatment of hepatitis C is much more than the risks in a lot of people. We see sometimes people who come to hepatitis C, for us for hepatitis C, and we say, I'm sorry, I cannot treat you. And the most common reason to say that sad answer is it's too late. If they have liver failure, we cannot treat them. So if we can catch the hepatitis C early, and we can treat and get rid of the virus, which could happen with the new treatment we have now, the chance could be up to 70, 75% in hepatitis C genome type 1. So you can reduce the, the, the hepatitis C virus to nil? We can cure it. Hepatitis C is the only chronic viral illness that can be cured. So we can cure it, but, but, here's the buts. Now let's yeah. talk about the buts. Yeah, let's talk about buts. Cost, toxicity of the therapy. True, the cost is there. How about how much? A lot. <laughs> if you're not insured. We, and this is why we really, uh, in, uh, in our hospital, we have a team. The, the medicine in general now becomes very complicated from financial aspects, from the treatment aspects, from a lot of involvement of, of a lot of physicians. We have a team. And with hepatitis C, one of our essential uh, member of that team is social worker. Um, she sees every patient with hepatitis C who think he should be treated or should be treated, and she investigates about how we can help that person to get some sort of insurance. Uh, if there is some help from the drug company, sometimes we ask for that. But if someone needs to be treated, he or she has to be treated, because if we leave the virus alone, that patient will come back later was liver failure or liver cancer, knee transplant, and the cost will be much more. If someone has cirrhosis of the uh, liver from hepatitis C, and you treat, and you are successful to get rid of the virus, the risk of liver failure in five years goes down to zero percent. Even with cirrhosis? Even with cirrhosis. You can reduce the chance of exactly. liver failure. Uh, uh, so there is no doubt if we can get rid of the virus, that would be the best thing to do in someone with hepatitis C. Because again, the liver could get better, the risk of liver cancer is much less, the risk of liver failure causing death is much less. Okay, so I'm convinced that I, I, I would certainly push my patients in that direction, but there are the costs, if you don't have the money, it's going to cost how many thousands per year, or is it limited to about a year of it? The how treatment long? is usually one, six months to one year, depending on what type of hepatitis C, because we have different types, yes. type one, two, three, four, five, six. Yes. Type one, which is the most common one in the United States, we treat for six months if the patient has no cirrhosis and responding to treatment, or a year most of the time if the patient has cirrhosis. Um, and the cost, Roughly per month is few thousand dollars per so month. So to be so, let's say that it's two thousand dollars for six months. It's twelve thousand dollars, or uh, uh, and if it's a year, I mean, if it's uh, a year, it's going to no, be twenty-four thousand. Much more than that. Or more I mean, if if for the new treatment, there is new treatment came out last year, about a year ago. The FDA approved two new treatment, two yeah. new types of pills. One called. Um, Bosoprevir and one called Tlaprevir. Yep. The cost of just that drug, they are given, one of them is given with interferon shot called begylated interferon yep. and ribavirin. The cost of the new pill alone per course, let's say six to 12 months, is between twenty-five to $50,000. So, in other words, uh, but this is something that's gonna be limited. It'll, it'll be a year. True. For the most, for, so let's put it this way: it's, it can be up to a hundred thousand dollars, but it could be less too. Well, true, but I think for the uh, the insurance companies, they know that if we don't treat that patient, 
and they end up with a liver, liver transplant, transplant there will be much more it's way more than that so and and uh, as you know it's not really in the health system it, we should not talk more about the cost because the life of a person uh, it doesn't matter how much you need to spend to save that person and treating hepatitis C is really can save a lot of right. lives um, you know, the dilemma is is there a time that I could borrow that money and actually if I didn't have insurance you know, and then that's the question of insurance. Mm -hmm. And then it also it begs the question of, let's say I'm 80 years of age, it's or right. 70, mm -hmm. or how, when, do you, when do you cut it off? So it's a difficult question, and we have True. to address that. And, and this is what, in medicine, I feel personally, it makes easier, not more difficult, is the individualized medicine. Every patient is different. It's a different person. Exactly right. Let's quickly, because we're running out of time, let's talk about hepatitis B and A. A is a simple type. People would get it from food. They turn yellow, and it goes away. They're infectious for a while. If they don't have anything else, they do fine, True. And, it, and they lose it. It's yeah. gone, and they're fine. They don't carry Most it. Most of the time. Most of the time. Yeah. And they don't carry it no. uh, uh, for the rest of their life. Yep. They get immunity to it. If they have one time uh, hepatitis A, right. they get immunity. And then there's hepatitis B. But before we, uh, and the great thing about hepatitis B is we now have a vaccine against it. Yes. But what about hepatitis C? Is there a vaccine? It's a very smart uh, virus, hepatitis C. Oh. Till now, uh, it's very, very difficult. So the research is going. Hopefully, hopefully, we'll have a vaccine for hepatitis C. Uh, but till now, the virus is much smarter than we've all been able to, than us. Yes, let's talk about hepatitis B. That's always been the bad one to me. I mean, I've often, you know, see this. I'm pre-hepatitis C. Yeah, I'm an older guy. So the question is, uh, hepatitis B. It can be a bad actor. Oh yes. Let's talk about it. It's carried mostly by sexual activity. True. The hepatitis B is a very unique disease, in a way that. People who get hepatitis B infection, it depends on what age did they get the virus to know what is the risk for them to have the chronic infection. If someone get acute hepatitis B as an adult, the risk for that person to have chronic hepatitis B is less than 10%. So most of the people, 90 plus percent of people who get hepatitis B, B as an adult, they get rid of the virus. By themselves? By themselves. And they don't carry it, and they don't bring a risk to anybody Exactly. Else. But if that person was young, let's say a baby who gets it from his mom during uh, birth, it, it's flipped around. So only 10% of people will get rid of the virus, and 90% of people or the kids or the we'll babies carry will carry it on. How, wh what is that turn? Where is that turn? How old are they before? The uh, in child, so the, the, the perinatal, meaning you, the baby got the infection from the mother. Yeah. Um, the child, like let's say from four years old till 10 years old, it's about 50%. So if, if we have 10 people who, or 10 kids who got the infection at the age of five, let's say, uh, five of them will get rid of the virus, five of them will have the virus as a chronic infection. And a chronic infection, then, and then? And then the chronic infection will go into stages. The virus sometimes could be sleepy, especially in people who get the infection as young, or could be active, as most of the adult people who get the infection as adult. And, and they carry it. And they carry it, and it replicates and can cause the same thing, chronic hepatitis, inflammation of the liver, scars, cirrhosis. And then, and then cancer. cancer. However, the hepatitis B is very unique than hepatitis C and in other liver disease that it can lead to liver cancer even without cirrhosis. So most of the cases of hepatitis C related cancer oh. happens on top of cirrhosis. But with hepatitis B, there's a different kind there's of cancer. Different. So you can get in the same cancer, hepatocellular carcinoma or liver cancer. They could get hepatitis B related liver cancer even if they don't have cirrhosis. So, uh, and, and it's interesting, uh, the liver test that we, uh, we draw, SGOT, SGPT, uh, uh, the, they're hepatocellular tests. Mm -hmm. The test that we uh, draw for uh, gallbladder disease or biliary tract disease is the alkaline phos. Mm -hmm. 
and that's the difference. This cholangiocarcinoma mm -hmm. of the biliary tract is totally different than this hepatocellular cancer that you're talking about that comes out of cirrhosis or out of hepatitis B. Yeah. Well, what, what about the cholangiocarcinoma? <laughs> Where is that from? It's very bad disease. It's really horrible disease. But talking about cholangiocarcinoma, what is the most common risk factor for cholangiocarcinoma? Ch chronic gallbladder disease? Hepatitis C. Oh, so it can also bring yeah. on cholangiocarcinoma. So the people with hepatitis C cirrhosis, because it's very common or more common than other liver disease, cholangiocarcinoma could happen in people with cirrhosis from hepatitis C. And the treatment is, is different there's very limited criteria for people with cholangiocarcinoma who can get liver transplant and still not approved yet, but there are some programs can do that. But the, the, the typical liver disease that lead to cholangiocarcinoma is a disease called primary sclerosing cholangitis, which means an autoimmune liver disease that affects the bile ducts, either the large big ones right. or the small tiny ones inside the liver. I think, though, the most common cancer of the liver is metastatic. True. Tell me what that is. So metastatic liver cancer is a cancer that comes from somewhere else as a primary, for example, colorectal cancer. Co colon cancer. Colon cancer. And that it, all of the veins of the colon and the small intestine, those veins drain to the liver. To the liver. And, then and the, it delivers the big filter, right? That sure. final filter that we have? Exactly. So the, 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 the cancer cells will get deposited in the liver and causes um, the cancer. The cancer, And if we catch it early, there is resection. People with liver metastatic cancer from colon cancer within certain criteria, they can cut, cut down that piece of the liver that has a cancer. And again, back to that point, the liver can regenerate. So if we can cut part of the liver with a cancer coming from the colon, the liver will be just fine. You know, that amazes me because that it was, uh, that's developed over the last 20 years too. Mm -hmm. That spread to the liver, that used to be a cyanar ba baby, yeah. We've got, they're gone. Yeah. You know, that means it's spread everywhere, but it doesn't necessarily it's mean not. it. It's not. It can be resected exactly. sometimes exactly. And, and we can say we've got it. And, and this is why we have the team there, it's called the hepatobiliary team, that we have the cancer um, physician or oncologist hepatobiliary surgeons, uh, hepatologists, radiologists, pathologists, interventional radiologists, all those guys are discussing case by case to decide what can be done for what, every patient. What's the next step? Yep, that's right. It's a team, uh, <coughs> uh, teamwork. Yep. I've seen that same teamwork with breast cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, that's an amazing thing. And then actually, I see that same teamwork in our community hospital of Brookings, where physicians get together uh, twice a week to talk about cases to, uh, in, in privacy, yep. about what True. we could do differently. Where are we in this uh, scenario? And that way we keep ourselves smart. It's an important thing exactly. to do. Exactly. Medicine becomes very complicated, very complex. And this is why we need a lot of brains together. It is not one man show as before. That one man show doesn't exist anymore in the medicine. The one man show is over. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Despite all the gathered knowledge available to physicians, sometimes we're helpless. She was in her mid-80s, a normal-sized, classy-dressed lady who walked into my office with yellow eyes. She stated her urine had turned dark and the stool turned light about a week ago. She was feeling ishy now for a couple of weeks, had lost five or ten pounds over the last month. She noted her belly was bloated, her skin was itchy, and her get up and go had got up and gone. My patient reminded me she was a farm wife who after her husband's death moved to town and lived in an apartment alone, although her kids lived nearby. She had led a careful life without exposure to excessive alcohol or drugs, was only taking a multiple vitamin, no herbal supplements, and had only one lifetime sexual partner. She had never received a transfusion, never been to a foreign country, no family history of liver disease or cancer, never been treated for diabetes, 
and no immune condition like lupus. Her husband had worked with farm chemicals and insecticides, and although they worked together sometimes moving cattle or with field work during harvest time, her jobs mostly involved outside dealing with chickens and inside preparing for meals without much exposure to chemicals. In short, she gave no clue to anything which may have caused an inflamed liver or hepatitis. We admitted her to the hospital where we obtained blood tests, imaging tests, a liver biopsy, all while monitoring her carefully, especially for bleeding problems. The biopsy report described fulminant or raging hepatitis. The viral test was positive for cytomegalovirus or CMV, and everything else was negative. We then discussed her case at length with the infectious disease and liver specialist by phone and kept her in our hospital as we were advised there was no advantage gained by referring her to a larger hospital. Despite following every recommendation of the experts and the textbooks, we observed how our patient's liver function continued to deteriorate. Over the next week and a half, she slipped away from our grasp and died in a coma surrounded by her children and their families. This was some 20 years ago, and it taught me how our lives truly depend on a functioning liver. But I still wonder about the case. Why did this common virus found in 80% of the adult population kill her? What could have done different, I have done differently to save this lovely lady? Despite all the gathered knowledge available to physicians, sometimes we are helpless. Hashem, you've, this is a story you've, you're, I'm sure you're familiar with. Yeah. Yeah, and you've cared for similar situations. Uh, as I reviewed cytomegalovirus and I thought about this case, I, it struck me that it really wasn't cytomegalovirus because it generally does not cause such problems, mm -hmm. although it can. It could. Yes. Uh, what, what's your suspicion here? She had no predisposing fa factors. It's either she uh, has some sort or she had some sort of uh, acute hepatitis A, hepatitis B uh, infection. Either one acute hepatitis A or B can lead to liver failure and death. Uh, or she could have what we call autoimmune hepatitis flare. An or, autoimmune disease like lupus. Yes, so autoimmune is basically our immune system start attacking the liver for unknown reason, and that causes inflammation and inflammation and then liver failure. What about uh, other diseases? I mean, gallbladder? I doubt, no. No, in fact, the, uh, the liver doesn't fail for gallbladder no, disease. No, it doesn't. And we would have had a better clue for that. Yep. Uh, uh, do you sense that there could have been a cancer? It doesn't present that way. No. It's, it's very unusual for cancer to present acutely like that. Um, are there viruses out there that we don't know about? Oh, yes. I'm sure in 2030 or 2050, the There's physicians going to be are yeah. going to say, those guys back there in 2010 were not very smart. That, they, that's the nature of medicine. Yeah, they didn't know hepatitis F or yes. L or yes. X. Yes. Uh, then. Well, that's where we're at. There's mm -hmm. a lot of illnesses that we don't understand. Mm -hmm. So we've just got a minute left. Uh, take home messages that you want to make sure people understand, Dr. Al Gore. Uh, take care of your liver, exactly as you said. Without a functioning liver, we cannot be alive. And the most important thing is we need to identify people with liver disease at an early stage because if we find them at late stage, it's sometimes too late. So be honest with your physician. If you have risk factor, excessive alcohol, intravenous drug use, any of those risk factors for liver disease, please tell your physician. And physicians, of course, will take care of that. Well, it's a humble organ, organ as you say. Very important one, and you have shared with us such a perspective yeah, I know I've learned a great deal from your visit here. Thank you. We really do appreciate you Thank you. for coming. 
Well, that closes our show on liver ailments. I sincerely thank our studio guest for visiting with us about this very important top topic, Dr. Hashem al Ghuri, a hepatologist, a liver transplant expert from Avera Medical Group Liver Disease in Sioux Falls. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Well, it was Peter Latham who recognized common sense is in medicine the master workman. Until next time, stay healthy out there, people. for On Call is provided in part by Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting and by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota additional funding provided by Dakota Care Regional Health the Brookings Health System, Dr. Mark Bubach with Dakota Allergy and Asthma, the South Dakota American College of Physicians, and Swiftel Communications. Closed captioning for On Call is provided by the generous support of Avera, the Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation.